What's going on everyone? In this video, we're gonna be talking about shaping Linux traffic with TC or traffic control. TC is a really awesome tool. I use it here and there to do some interesting simulations of packet loss, of bandwidth control, of all kinds of cool stuff. But it's generally a great tool for doing kind of neat stuff at a, at a packet Linux traffic flow level where you can do everything from implement quality of service in a router-like fashion to, again, some of these more specific use cases that I talk about around um, you know, uh, simulating certain scenarios on nodes and, and so on. So we're gonna cover a bunch of cool stuff today. First, we're gonna talk about a use case around quality of service. That'll be one of the first things that we cover. We're then going to get into traffic control, the tool itself, how it works, some of the key concepts. And then finally, we'll go through an implementing of a, a shaping exercise. And if you're not familiar with what I mean by shaping, We'll be talking about that, don't worry. Um, but we're gonna end with kind of a concrete example of how we can do some, some cool stuff with TC. So starting us off, let's add some context around this notion of quality of service just to kind of uh, to, to set the stage. Now, TC is not just to implement things like quality of service, but quality of services I think is a really good example of something that you can set up. And just to level set what quality of service means. Now, you don't have to be a Linux guru to understand quality of service. Many of us are actually pretty familiar with the idea of quality of service because many of us use a router that supports some amount of quality of service setup inside of our, our home or work networks. And there's a bunch of different ways that we can do quality of service. One way is we can do it from kind of a client perspective and we could say, okay, well, uh, laptop one, and then there's folks on the guest network, so guest two, right? And in a very simple model, there's ways for us to look at the devices themselves connecting to the router, okay? And we can actually put in specific rules about the degree to which their traffic should be limited. So maybe folks that are uh, considered a guest or MAC addresses that aren't on a known list, they have a cumulative limit of 10 megabits per second inside of the network, while um, you know specifically laptops or groups of laptops get a larger pool of 100 megabits per second because they're trusted and they're known devices that should have priority to the bandwidth itself. And then there's ways to do not just the source and quality assurance, or sorry, quality assurance, quality of service based on the source, but also the destination. So we could think of things like, well, when the router goes out and sends to, you know, let's say uh, some internal network that's super important for us, like this theoretical CIDR range, we want to be able to prioritize the traffic that we allow here. So maybe we allow kind of an upload speed there of a thousand megabits per second, right? And then in kind of the fall through case, let's just use every other IP address, right? We wanna ensure that going to public facing traffic, which is less critical, has a, a limit of a hundred megabits per second guaranteed. And things can get even fancier from here, right? Maybe we don't just wanna say, well, only give this 100 megabits per second if there's unused bandwidth. So maybe at kind of a larger scale here, there might be some scenario where we wanna take you know, the larger pool, which let's say we have 2000 megabits per second available, or you know what, even like, let's say uh, 1500 megabits per second. And the idea being if the uh, if this network isn't saturating its throughput, then in that case, let's go ahead and let this upgrade all the way up to maybe the full network capacity, 1500 megabits per second. But the second that this starts needing to take in traffic and do stuff, it should largely get priority, in which case all of our traffic to this bottom path here would then be limited to 100 megabits per second. So these kind of scenarios, you can actually implement things like this with TC. And like I said, kind of taking a, you know, a, a more specific example for how I use it, I'm, I'm not implementing routers or quality of service or anything like that. But you know, in my world, I work with a lot of containerized workloads. And in these environments, you've got one machine with perhaps 10, 20, hundreds of containers sometimes on them. And I can simulate cool things. Like I could say, all right, all of a sudden this machine can only transmit 10 megabits per second. How does that impact all the workloads running on it? Or perhaps, all right, all of a sudden this machine is dropping every 700th packet. 
what impact does that have on my complex system and, and so on. So it's just a super powerful tool for doing everything from quality of service tile stuff to what I'm talking about here, all the way down to some of kind of the more simulation type work that I often use TC for. So with that being said, we probably should talk a little bit about what TC is. So if you have a Linux host lying around, it's quite likely that you can just type in man TC to get the man pages and you'll get them right here because TC is likely already on your system and available. As the name implies, TC, it's traffic control. It lets us manipulate the settings. The TC tool lets us manipulate the traffic control settings. Um, that uh, are used kind of in the, in the Linux uh, networking stack, specifically with the kernel. And there's a couple different things in the man pages that get called out here. First off is the ways that you can control traffic, okay? And there's a couple different ways that you can do this. Our focus is gonna be around this idea of shaping traffic. And this is focused with uh, impacting the rate of transmission. Now, Oftentimes when you hear rate of transmission, you just meet, you just think, oh, okay, well, you know, that means I'm going to be able to lower the amount of, you know, uh, transmission available or bandwidth available. And that is a totally a use case, but there's tons of more advanced cases with priorities and all these different things you can do when you're shaping the traffic. Outside of shaping, there's a bunch of other options that you could check out, things like scheduling, policying, and dropping traffic. Um, all of these different things can be used to do kind of advanced traffic control stuff, so they might be worth checking out. But our focus for today is going to be around this idea of shaping traffic. Now, let's talk a bit about the components that make up TC, and this will help us kind of frame some of the, the initial bits, and we'll diagram them as we talk about them. The first is a QDisk, uh, which stands for queuing discipline. And this is the thing that the kernel will send a packet, uh, or sorry, will enqueue uh, you know, packets to and eventually pull packets off. So think of this kind of like a queue. The kernel can put packets into it. And then afterwards, the kernel will try to get as many packets as possible from that queue disk eventually giving them to the network driver. So how this looks from a conceptual standpoint on, on let's say like a Linux host. So we'll just take a box here, move it over, all right? So let's call this our Linux host. We'll make it a little bit bigger and we'll bring this up and say, here we go, let's say Linux host, okay? And then obviously on a Linux host, we've eventually got the network adapter. I'm going to represent this in software by calling out the network interface. So let's say that the interface is ETH0, okay? Now on a given Linux stack, be it, or Linux host, be it containers, be it processes, whatever it might be, you eventually, and I mean containers really are processes, right? So let's, let's just call this process zero. Typically some things happen in the Linux networking stack where the uh, process eventually gets packets out to the the uh, the interface and then that sends uh, sends those packets out to some destination likely outside of the host. So let me just get rid of this extra arrow here. Cool. So this is you know <laughs> definitely not talking about a couple very key components, right? Um, there's obviously a lot of stuff happening in the Linux networking stack to facilitate this, but it kind of gets the point across, I think, at at a bit of a conceptual level. Now, to further that somewhat naive explanation that just, again, aids us in the conceptual idea here, let's talk about the actual QDisk itself. So what we're talking about adding here is effectively something we can sort of think about like a Q. And instead of going right to ETH0, we'll be able to filter these packets more or less and make sure that they make their way into this Q that, again, the kernel will eventually pull directly off of and send to, uh, send to the network interface. Now, the introduction of this queue, while it does add like an intermediary step, it adds a lot of functionality because we will eventually learn how we can add these things called classes inside of here. And classes will basically mean that instead of they're just being kind of a first in first out model where when things get queued up, the kernel just pulls them out as quick as possible. We do fancier stuff like we enforce these things where we say, all right, like, kind of don't let the kernel know, but we're gonna hide things behind the scene and only let it get 10 megabits per second you know, out of here. So again, talking about kind of the quality of, uh, quality of service controls and all that good stuff, 
we're actually going to be able to do that inside of these queue disks. Which brings up uh, our other big piece, which is the classes themselves. So queue disks can contain classes, which can then contain further queue disks, <laughs> which might seem a little confusing, but there's basically this parent-child relationship you can do. Um, I won't talk much more about that right now until we get into the example, because that will bring some of it to light. But as I mentioned, classes are going to let us do some of the more complex things with the queue disks. In the man pages, you'll find two categories. There is this idea of classless queue disks. So these are queue disks without a class associated with them. Um, an example of that, like I had mentioned, is first in, first out, which is the default. In the FIFO model, this is almost like a no impact type operation. Things get queued up, they get pulled out as quickly as they can in first in, first out order. And then there are the class full queue disks, okay? And these are the ones that we're gonna be focusing on. There's a bunch in here, you can read through them. The one we're gonna focus on is one called the hierarchy token bucket, or as I'll be calling it throughout this, HTB. Now, HTB is going to allow us to have guaranteed bandwidth for classes, exactly what we want. We want the ability to say, you can send this much traffic at this rate, based on this IP address you're sending to, you know, some, some scenario sort of like that. So that's largely what uh, HTB is gonna do. Um, and, and I should mention, in, in case uh, you wanna dig a little bit deeper into HTB, the documentations on that are also great. You can just do man tc htb and it will bring up the documentation for this specific class. So um, you know, I'd recommend definitely checking out and reading through this. Obviously, I'm not gonna get into all these bits, but we will look at some of the key, key parameters like ceilings and rates and priority and, and all that good stuff. But for now, let's go back to our, our main page. So we've talked a bit about queue disks, we've talked a bit about classes, and I even alluded a little bit to filters. Filters are going to give us the ability to say, as I diagrammed here, based on some property of the packet, it should be going into this specific queue disk. So this could be looking at the packet from like a source destination type setup. Um, let me switch the navigation down here to traffic control, there we go. Um, source navigation, or source destination type uh, type packet, and eventually get it into into the the queue disk that's appropriate for it, with ideally the class that's appropriate for it as well. So we've got queue disks, we've got classes, we've got filters. Those are some of the main constructs inside of TC. So before we get too deep into implementing it, let's kind of lay out what the tree more or less looks like with uh, with this TC bit setup. So here's what we're gonna here's what we're gonna try to implement. So if we think about this kind of like a tree, we know that there is going to be a root queue disk. And my understanding is there's always a root queue disk. I'm pretty sure that's a fair statement, unless there's some edge cases I'm not aware of. Uh, and the root queue disk, as we had mentioned, is the main component that the kernel is actually gonna talk to. So let's just put something up here so we don't forget um, kernel. And, and one of the, the key reasons I think it's worth calling this out is we're gonna kind of formulate a tree down here with a bunch of different nodes. And a lot of times conceptually, we think of trees like top down where you know uh, the, the root would eventually go to some child and then maybe send the packet out, but it's actually quite the reverse. The kernel is interacting with root to both in queue packets and also to DQ packets to be sent out. So um, everything kind of bubbles back up through the kernel, if, if that kind of makes sense. Maybe when we get into the example, it'll, it'll help a little bit. But what we wanna implement here off of the root is what I'm going to call uh, QDisk1, I suppose. We'll assume that root is kind of like QDisk0. And then the idea with this is that um, QDisk1 is something we're gonna implement a class inside of. And the class is basically gonna limit us to uh, 10 megabits per second, via the hierarchy token bucket or HTB. And then what we'll effectively wanna do here is set up a filter that basically says, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna kinda use some pseudo code here. Again, this isn't like a, a perfectly technically accurate diagram, it's just to get the concepts across. If destination equals um, uh, U1 or U2, and I'll talk about what these are. These are host names, so host U1 or U2. Um, then go to uh, QDisk1, 
okay? So this pseudocode is effectively what we're calling a filter, right? And the filter is basically going to be here to say, um, again, as the packets come in, let's actually look at them and let's figure out what their destination is. And based on that, we can go to this Q disk, which in theory, if you're sending to U1 or U2, it would go to this Q disk. And the end result would be that we'd end up with traffic limiting at about 10 megabits per second. So that's kind of roughly what we're gonna be setting up here as, as an initial take, and then we'll expand on it. And if it feels a little bit academic and conceptual at this point, that's okay. Let's let's now transition it from traffic control into actually implementing the shaping itself. And we'll talk a little bit about this more concretely. So to demonstrate this, I've got three servers set up, okay? I've got U0 at the very top. This is going to be our client. U1 is server one, U2 is server two. Now, in order to show this traffic stuff happening consistently, I'm gonna be using a tool called iPerf. You can download iPerf with your package manager. And basically what iPerf is gonna let us do is basically send uh, traffic through to kind of gauge what the bandwidth is. So on each of these servers, I'm gonna run iPerf perf in a server mode for dash s um, and i think we're also going to put in a port here for 8080 and i think that should be about it great so iperf is listening on port 80 let's do the same thing here so iperf we will do server on port 8080 listening on 8080 you know what i think i might have just done there's two versions of iperf on these servers just to make it extra confusing. Let's make sure we're using the same version here. So iperf3, iperf3. Now on the client, what I can do here is I can connect to these iperf servers. So effectively, I should be able to say something like iperf3 and say that this is a client, and then I can put in the IP address of U1, which I know is 192.168.5.0. The port is 8080, and I'm also gonna time this test for 30 seconds. So we'll go ahead and run it here. We can see that it's connected. I'm gonna zoom into server one, and it's gonna start giving me output of what my bandwidth is. Now, this should be really fast bandwidth because these are virtual machines on the same hypervisor. I can see I'm getting roughly, let's say 19 gigabits per second uh, in this particular test from my client side. So I'll zoom out. The client at the top from U0 is giving me similar results. Again, this is just kind of the client perspective. And after 30 seconds here, it should finish. And then for a sanity check, I should do the same thing on U2. So the IP address for U2 is 5.1. We'll go ahead and hit that and zoom in and almost the same results, right? Obviously it's gonna fluctuate a little bit, but I'd say we're getting somewhere in the wheelhouse of 19 gigabits per second communicating with U2. So very fast, and when we enforce our throttling here, it's probably gonna be very apparent that we're throttling because we're gonna drop down quite significantly, especially if we go into our use case. Actually, let's even bump this up. Let's say, let's bump ourselves up to 100 megabits per second just to make it a little bit uh, more reasonable. So how do we implement this from a TC level? Well, we basically want to inject this into what the client is, right? Because we're throttling bandwidth from the client to specific destinations. So what I'm gonna do here with y'all is write a little script. And like most of my videos, there's a blog post accompanying this. So if you want to check out the actual script that I write here, check out the blog post. It'll be in the description of this video. You're welcome to kind of test it out for yourself, all right? so. Here is what we're going to do um, with, with this script. We're gonna first set up a couple different key variables. The first thing we'll do, you know, let's go ahead and declare that this is a, a bash script. It probably would be fine with bin sh, but let's just do bin bash. And then we're gonna set up some key variables. First thing is the TC binary. Now, on most systems, the TC binary is gonna always exist inside of sbin, and it's gonna be TC. So I'm gonna store this here so I can reference it throughout. We're also gonna call out the network interface, because that's gonna be important to ensure we're attaching to the right interface. The interface is going to be, let's go back to our server real quick, and I'll just do an IPA command. Our interface is ENS160. So ENS160 is what we will store inside of this variable here. And the last thing I wanna set up, at least for right now, is what our upper limit is gonna be. And as we talked about in our diagram, we wanna do 100 megabits. Now, how did I know Mbit here? If you do go back into the man pages for TC, there is a section somewhere in here 
that lists out what, yeah, all the bandwidth parameters are. So for rates, um, there's a whole list here. You can do bits versus bytes, and then you've obviously got kilo, mega, giga, tera, you know, so on and so forth. So all that is pretty much good to go. And we're gonna limit at 100 megabits per second inside of here. And then the last thing I'm gonna call out is the destination CIDR. Okay, so this is gonna be, again, when we filter, what is the location that we wanna be looking for here? And the destination CIDR that I'm gonna start off with is gonna be 192.168.5.0. Um, and I'll do slash 32 to make it just this IP. Now, the reason I'm not doing both of my IPs here is I actually wanna be able to show y'all that we're throttling just to one destination. So ideally, I should see the throttling happening when going to U1, but I should not see the throttling happening when I go to U2, if, if all works well here, all right? So all is well right here, and um, since this is, I don't know, we're, we won't actually use these functions in like a fancy way, but I'm just gonna make functions just to keep it somewhat clean, I, I, just arbitrarily here. And what we're gonna do as the first step for the function create is we're going to say create, and then we'll do this here just so we can identify our log messages. And I will say something like um, shaping init. So this is how I know shaping is starting. And the first thing that we're gonna do is set up that root queue disk. Cause as we talked about, I need the root to eventually get the QDisk with the class in place. So let's set up the root QDisk. What we'll do for here is we will run the TC command. We will say QDisk add, and this will be pointing at the device, which is our interface. So I will do the IF since we've got that stored. And with that, we will call this a root. We will say handle one, and this one here is effectively the identifier. We'll do, I think the zero is implied with TC. I can't really, I can't really recall how that works actually. If someone knows, leave it in the comments, but I'm gonna say one colon zero here and think of this like a, a class, or I guess an ID, and then this is like a sub ID. Um, it'll, the relationship will become more apparent soon. I'm probably using wrong verbiage there. But one zero is gonna be our identifier. And we're gonna call out that it's gonna use HTB and there's also this thing that you can do in here. I'll, I'll do a quick break line. Um, there's also this thing you can do in here that is uh, a default, uh, which, I, which I like a lot. So default is the idea that in the case that we don't have a QDisk to qualify this for, what QDisk should things default to? So perhaps in like a quality of service scenario, there's like a QDisk with very limited bandwidth where things that kind of shouldn't even be coming in here that got in, automatically go to. So I'm just gonna set up a default because we'll use it a little bit later. The default is gonna be um, pointing to uh, 30, which is probably pretty arbitrary for you right now, but I'll, I'll bring to light what that maps to very shortly here. So we've got the most important thing here, which is we're adding a queue disk, uh, and this is the root queue disk. Now that we've got the root queue disk, we need to actually add one of these kind of leaf queue disks or children queue disk with, the, with a class inside of it. So let's start off by doing that now. So we'll do TC and we're basically gonna do a, another, uh, another add here, if you will. But this time we're gonna say class add for TC. This is gonna be a dev again, a device, which is gonna be, of course, our same interface. That's not gonna change. And we're gonna call out what the parent is so it knows what root queue disk it belongs to. The parent in this case is going to be one zero. Okay, so that points again to this ID that we have for our root queue disk. And with the parent in place, I'm also going to specify a class ID. So this is basically gonna be the ID of this class, kind of like the root has its own ID up here. And the ID of this class is going to be one, one. Okay, so that'll be the ID of this specific class. This is also gonna be HTB, and this time, since this is an actual class, we'll be able to set up a rate itself, all right? So the rate here is going to be effectively our limit. If all goes well and things make their way into this queue disk or, or this class, if you will, um, this is going to effectively uh, is going to effectively uh, be able to, to limit our stuff here, okay? 
So now that we've got this, this kind of class in place, right? We've got, I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of mixing up my verbiage a bit. We've got the QDisk here, and then we've got the class that's pulling off of it. So this is effectively our, our root QDisk, our QDisk. This is effectively our class, if you will, just to make sure we're clear on that. And then the last thing we need to do is we need to make sure that we have a filter in place so that packets that meet this destination cider actually make their way into here. Now, one uh, tip and trick I pulled off of the docs uh, is to use an environment variable here because the filter uh, syntax is a little bit long form. And with filters, I should mention there are a couple different types of filters in the man pages. Um, you can read about those right here in the filters section. Um, there's a bunch of different ones. We're going to use what I believe is probably the most common, U32. This is basically a general purpose filtering mechanism, which is another way of saying we can look at properties on the packet, <coughs> excuse me, and determine which, um, which things we want to uh, filter into as far as, uh, as, far as Q disks uh, or, or classes are, are effectively concerned, okay? So U32 is what we're gonna use, and I'm gonna store this in an environment variable just to keep it kind of short and sweet here because the syntax, again, is a little long. So the syntax that we're going to have here is we're going to be, again, running the TC command. We're going to be adding a filter, so filter add. The device is, once again, going to be our same interface that we're used to. The protocol here, protocol is going to be IP, all right? And the parent is going to be that QDisk ID. So we're going to do one zero here that we're pointed to. Um, prio is one. Okay, priority one, and this is uh, again a U32 filter, all right? So we've got most of the pieces in place to kind of use this filter generically. The only things we need to add when we run this filter are effectively what destination IP we want to match against. So this is something that I've just got written down because I use this type of filter a lot. And you can kind of see how the pieces fit together. Now, let's go ahead and use U32 now that we've got this set up. So inside of create here, we'll go down and we're going to say U32, right? And we're going to add on to that command. So we're going to match the IP, all right? And we're going to look at destination. And this is going to specifically use the destination CIDR that we pulled out. And then the last thing we need to do is call out uh, effectively a, a flow ID here that we're going to be mapping to. So the flow ID that we're going to be mapping to is actually going to be the class ID of this limited class. So the flow ID will be 1, 1. And now we should pretty much be set up. So if it's not completely clear, what happens with this is on the Linux host, it's going to set these things up so that they're just there. It's not like we run this before, you know, we do something with our program. On the host, we're going to, I mean, I guess we could, but on the host, we're going to run this and then it's going to be completely set up. It's going to be like a global rule on that Linux host for what we do with traffic matching this filter. And then the last thing I'll do just for the sake of our logs is just quickly call out that uh, shaping is done. Um, I should really say shaping config is done, but you kind of get the point. And the last thing I'll, I'll want to do here, because we're going to use this quite a bit, um, is I'm going to also put in a clean function. And the idea, again, being that once create runs, this will globally be put in place. It would probably be wise for me to erase any existing QDisk stuff that's set up before I run this create, especially for some of the testing that we're going to do here. So what we'll do here is run a, a pretty simple command. We're going to do TC. We're going to say uh, QDisk, if you will, delete device. Um, we're going to point to our same interface. And this time, we're just going to point at the, the root device for that, uh, for that interface. So this will, again, do cleanup and will pretty much be set. Now, I have these functions in here, so we could do like command line arguments and things like that. But I'm not going to waste time in this video doing that. What we'll do here is keep it really simple and just literally call clean and create. Um, and then we'll come in here and kind of build on these as we get a little bit more fancy. But hopefully that gives you an idea. This, this should, if all goes well, have implemented basically what we were talking about here. So let's, let's go ahead and, and try out this script. So I will go back to this bash window and I will SCP up the throttle sh file that I've set up. Again, this is going to u0, the client server. 
So we'll go back to the client server here. We'll clear it out and we'll see if we have typos and stuff we need to fix up. But server one is still listening. Server two is still listening. And we will just double check for sanity's sake that throttle is here. Throttle is here. That all looks pretty familiar, right? And we've got the right IP address. Okay, so let's try to run throttle and see if it goes well. So we run throttle and we need to be root, which would definitely make sense. You certainly should be a root user if you're doing this kind of stuff. So let's sudo run throttle. And interesting, no such file or directory is a little, oh, that might be from the cleanup happening. I'm thinking that's from the cleanup. So um, I should have put echo commands in there. Otherwise I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known. Um, so shaping init, shaping done in theory, our QDisk is set up. We can even use TC to kind of get and list uh, kind of what the configuration currently is. But let's just go ahead and assume it worked and see if we can hit our, our servers now. So in theory, I should still be able to call server two and not be throttled, fingers crossed. So this is a command for server two. I expect no changes. Let's just do it for 10 seconds. So I'm calling server two and um, it's still pretty darn fast. It's certainly faster than 100 megabits per second, right? So we're calling server two at 20 or 19 gigabits per second. Now, if our filtering went right, any process, any application, any command that calls U1, which again is on this IP address, should now be throttled. At least that is the hope. So let's try it out. We'll do that, we'll zoom in, check it out. We have limited bandwidth. So we know that U1 is totally capable of 100 megabits per, or uh, sorry, 19 gigabits per second. But now we're seeing it get throttled. And you can tell it's not getting exactly what the full megabits per second are. Um, it could be because there's other processes that are talking to the server, right? That's using up a little bit of bandwidth. It could also just be the calculation, you know, isn't, perfect in, in regards to like how much it's sending and how much it's receiving and all that good stuff. But effectively we are being limited. We are seeing ourselves get right around hundred megabits per second when talking to that server. So that is pretty darn cool. It is actually set up and good to go. Now, since that worked so well, I say in this video, let's try to make it a little bit more complicated just to give you kind of an idea of how advanced this stuff can get. So Conceptually check this out. We know we've got QDisk1 at uh, 100 megabits per second. Now, let's say that in theory, we want to introduce um, some children off of this or some leafs off of this. Let's, let's bring this up a little bit. And let's say that we want this to be a little bit more complex where, and I actually don't even know, I think technically it's okay to call this a QDisk, right? I, I, correct me in the comments if I'm wrong here, but this is our class. I'm just gonna call this, uh, well, let's call it by the IDs. That'll make it a little bit simpler. So this is the class ID, which is one one. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't be calling that a Q disk, but I, I think technically under the hood it might. It technically is. Anywho, um, so this this is one one. We know that root is one zero. Okay, so that that works pretty well. Now, what if we want to make this a little bit fancier? We want to introduce basically like um, one ten, um, and we want to do one ten and since I did default 30, I probably should do 130. So these are arbitrary ID numbers. Um, I, I don't have a third server, so I'm not gonna do 120, but 110 and 130. And basically the idea that I have here is inside of this class, I wanna go ahead and limit 110 to have upwards of, let's say, 75 megabits per second, okay? And then I want 130, to have the ability to have, um, let's say, 50 megabits per second, okay? So the thought process here is that not only do I want to be able to limit specifically to 75 here and 50 here, but I also want to have a relationship with the parent here where when it's unused, I can borrow unused bandwidth from the parent. So in theory, 50 megabits per second is kind of like my um, my baseline, right, that I, I will get up to, or, or I guess kind of be guaranteed in a way. 
Um, guaranteed is maybe too strong, but we'll, we'll be given in a way. But when not used, I want to go ahead and just consume, um, you know, upwards of 100 megabits per second. Or maybe maybe what could make this use case, uh, you know, a little bit more interesting is let's say let's 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 actually take a slightly different spin on it. Let's say that this can have 80 megabits per second. And yeah, let's keep it simple. So this can have 80 megabits per second. So not so much, um, how do I put this? Like in, in, in a way here that like, I want to be able to use the parent as like a, a global limiter, I guess you could say. Something where bandwidth is being borrowed from the parent. So here's here's, let me just concretely put it since I'm not using my words right. This can have 80 megabits per second going to a host. This can have 80 megabits per second going to a host. But the parent offers us up 100 megabits per second in total. So in a theoretical world where just 110 is firing off to some host or being it, packets are being dequeued to send off to some host, it will give you 80 megabits per second. But in that theoretical world, if uh, 130 should be active as well, then these would actually both bog themselves down to 50 megabits per second because that's what they would be bringing in from the parent, <laughs> if that makes sense. So you can see how we're kind of getting advanced and really like putting in kind of these hierarchical relationships. But the key thing is everything still gets pulled off at the root level from the kernel. But effectively, as we kind of pull through, we have this limit here of 100 megabits per second. Even though these are capable of 80, should this be saturated, these two should actually be impacted by the fact that the parent offers up um, you know, 80 in total, if that sort of, sort of makes sense. So let's try this out. And we're obviously going to need a bunch, a bunch more fancy filters. We're going to need a filter that says something like, if you won... I want to go to 110 now, okay? And if you two, I wanna go to 130, let's say, all right? So we're gonna be changing up filters and we're gonna basically be adding these, uh, these children classes in, okay? So let's, let's go ahead and see if we can, we can set this up and <laughs> not get too confusing here. So we've got the we've got the parent set up, and we know that the parent limit is 100 megabits per second. So that's good. Let's let's add in the child limit number, which we will call 80 megabits per second. Um, 80 megabits. All right. So that'll be an important thing for us to reference a bit later. So we've got the QDisk. We've got um, let's uh, my my verbiage here, my naming might get me in a bit tr of trouble, but let's just call it these to conceptualize things, okay? So we've got root, we've got parent, and then I'm going to call these uh, children or leafs, if you will. Um, and then let's go ahead and set up some of these some of these lower level ones. So first thing we're going to do is basically just make another class. So if we do a TC class and we add the device for the interface, just like we did before, okay? So we'll add in the interface. We're now going to reference who the parent is, but the parent, of course, this time is not going to be root. The parent this time is going to be this class or one one. So parent in this case is in fact one one. Then we're gonna put in a class ID here. Okay, and the class ID for this one is going to be arbitrarily 110. Um, so one and then 10 is like, I think they call it the what is it, the sub ID or something? Nonetheless, this is my, my identifier, 110. This is gonna be HTB, and I am going to be putting in a rate. Now, the rate that I am going to get to here is going to be kind of like a, I guess you could say like a starting rate that we're going to kind of kick off with. So what we can do here is, um, let's say like, uh, start rate, I guess you could say. And let's say that we want to start ourselves out at five megabits per second. Um, and this, this might seem a, a little bit weird at first, but bear with me. Hopefully I'll be able to bring it to light. So we've got the, the new thing here. We've got the rate and we're going to say start rate is what the rate is. So we're going to start ourselves off at five megabits per second. Now, what we're going to be able to do in here is actually set up what the ceiling itself should look like. So the ceiling is gonna be that theoretical upper bounds that we could hit. So when we put in uh, the ceiling command, okay, we're then gonna have child limit be effectively the ceiling. So there's a delta between start and ceiling, and ceiling can go all the way up to that 80 megabits per second, all right? 
So we've got the ceiling in place, all looks well, it's pulling from the parent. So when it hits the start and starts consuming up towards the ceiling, again, it'll be reliant on what it can borrow from the parent. And if the parent's exhausted, um, you know, because 130, our new class we're gonna create now is being used, um, there will be some impact in, in how the traffic works. So let's basically copy this exact thing. And this is gonna be for, again, 130 in this case. We're gonna start off at the same thing. We're gonna have the child be the same thing. Really the only difference here is that we've got a unique, uh, a unique identifier here that we'll be able to set the filters up to use, okay? So now we've got one filter here which goes in for, uh, for one one. It goes up to this parent. But now we actually wanna be sending things into the leafs. We wanna be filtering so that things go into these buckets instead, if you will, rather than going into the parent itself. So inside of the flow ID, I'm simply gonna change this to 110, and now we're gonna be mapping packets with this destination cider into 110. And then we'll go ahead and do, um, you know, this is where my variable names are gonna fail me a bit. We'll do destination cider two, and this is gonna map into 130, okay? So if we go into destination cider, We'll do destination cider two. This will be uh, that specific IP address. Again, I could be using bigger ciders here, but you know, just conceptually bear with me. Destination cider two is now inside of here. So we've got these mapped. We've got these theoretically flowing into traffic control to go into the right bucket. And in short, that should pretty much be it. Um, we now should have this kind of hierarchical setup bearing any typos or mistakes. So let's see if this works. We'll make a, a quick enhancement here because I know that kind of threw me off before. Clean init, okay, and then we'll say clean uh, done here as well, just to make sure I've got some logging info um, on that as well. So yeah, I mean that, I think that should be about it. Let's let's see if it works. Um, so we'll go back to our terminal. I will SCP up the throttle command one more time. We'll do a quick sanity check uh, with less here to see if throttle is good. And yeah, I can see our new clean command, so that all looks well. Let's go ahead and run throttle on the uh, on the client, and. <laughs> As usual, I have forgotten to run into sudo, so let's do that. We'll sudo throttle. Okay, so at least as far as TC is concerned, we, I can't say I mapped everything correctly for sure yet, but we have initiated the different pieces and it, it syntactically was okay as far as the, the kernel is concerned. So now we'll go back. We will look at our servers. Uh, U1 is running, U2 is running. Now it's just a matter of running the iperf through. So I think the first test that would be appropriate is let's just focus on uh, dequeuing off of one of these classes. In other words, let's only send packets to uh, U1 and make sure that it does reach around 80 megabits per second. So we'll do iperf here. We've already got it set up for U1. Let's hit that. Let's look in and awesome. As you can see here, we're approaching pretty close to 80 megabits per second. So that validated, of course, that this is working well, but it doesn't necessarily validate that kind of parent borrowing thing I was talking about. If 130 goes off at 80 megabits per second, which we could certainly show without a problem, let's just do that real quick. We'll do one here. Now we have this firing off 80 megabits per second, but we talked about this. We don't really want our server exhausting a cumulative 100. This is really borrowing from the parent. It shouldn't use more than that. So let's set ourselves up with just like a, a little micro script here. So we'll say, um, we'll call this um, iperf.sh, uh, iperf I guess. Um, and I'll just make it executable right here before I forget. iperf.sh. All right, great. So if I go back and just look at the commands we ran before, let me grab those to keep it simple. Here's the client command, great. We will go ahead and just put these in and I won't even, <coughs> excuse me, I won't even put in um, the bin bash thing at the top here. This will be quite simple. So we'll do that um, and let's, let's make these longer just so we don't miss anything. So the idea I've got here is I'm just going to use ampersand to not attach to the process and we'll actually run these and we'll just look from a server level what the bandwidth looks like when we sort of run these two effectively in parallel. I'm gonna launch two separate processes to run this iperf command. So we've got that, all right? 
We're gonna zoom into these once we get started, but let's just go ahead and uh, let's run this thing. So I perf sh, boom, and now, Awesome, check it out. So if we look at our two servers down here, you can now see they are roughly only getting 50 megabits per second because um, again, they're pulling or borrowing from that parent. So effectively their 80 is never reached because they're using that capacity of 100. And clearly it's weighting evenly in this case. I'm not sure exactly how the weighting mechanism works, if it always would be even, or if there's some other kind of priority thing that gets set up, but it's working exactly as we'd expect. In fact, we can even demonstrate this better. If we look inside of the iPerf script real quick, and we did, um, let's run this one for 10 seconds and then server two for 30. So what I expect to happen here is we start off at 50-50, test, uh, actually let me, I'm mixing these up real quick. This, I'll put this one at 10, so it's the, the U1. U1 should stop receiving traffic in about 10 seconds, and then I think we're gonna see U2 ramp up bandwidth because it's now gonna have more that it can actually pull from the parent. So let's validate that theory and run iPerf again. So here we go. We can see we're at about 50-50. I'm expecting this middle buffer here to quit in 10 seconds. And we can actually see a little bit of a drop here. I'm not sure exactly what caused that. But now, once that got killed, we're back at 80 megabits per second on U3, uh, U2 because that is still receiving traffic. So we have effectively implemented a pretty cool system around quality of service here that we could do all kinds of interesting stuff with, right? Um, it's not just you know building a router, it's simulating weird things in your environment, maybe handling certain traffic things on just a Linux host level. There's just a lot of freaking cool stuff that you can do here um, around this. So overall, that worked pretty well. And, and like I had mentioned, if you wanna take a look at the script I wrote, I'll be sure to post it on my website in the description. But all in all, that's TC. So I hope you found this video really interesting. This is a tool I love talking about. Um, it maybe just gives you some ideas, some areas you can play around with. Um, if you like this content, be sure to give it a like, throw a comment in if you have some feedback, um, some ideas, I'd love to hear them. But until next time, I will talk to you later. See you then.